to all of you out there. Hey, everybody. If you can't tell, I'm Matt Parham. And, and I'm Chris Matthews. That's right. And we're coming at you with another fatherly fandom episode review. This time for the Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, episode three, titled Adar. Adar. After this. Welcome back, everybody. Yes, welcome back indeed. We have had the fine privilege of reviewing the latest episode mm -hmm. of our newest Lord of the Rings content, thanks to Amazon Prime. So if you have seen this episode, we're going to get right into it, talk to you about some information, because this episode was packed oh. with stuff. It is packed to the gills. Oh. Yes. So we're going to give you a little bit of background, our opinions on what was good, what was great, what wasn't so good, or other such questionable items, yep. and then give you our final review of this episode. So Chris, what did you think? Oh man. So first, first off, I want to talk about, um, we were talking about like the reception of this, this series and everything, and Amazon said last Saturday, the first episode of The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power series attracted over 25 million viewers globally on its Woo. first day so making it the biggest ever debut for a show on amazon prime video streaming service so yeah thought that was pretty cool we finally got a little bit of viewership information i we, i don't think we got any raw data yet right right matt no no i think they're still keeping it under wraps trying yeah. to control that review bombing that goes on and yeah. Oh, there's such nonsense. Uh, but... Which is a, yeah, a big thing, and you can read all about that. There's lots of articles about uh, the review bombing and everything else going on with it. So far, we're all we're definitely liking it. I, I'm liking this series. Uh, so this one, episode three, Adar, was directed by Wayne Che Yip and written by Jason Cahill and Justin Dobble. Uh, I looked up the Rotten Tomatoes score for this episode, and the reception seems to be pretty good. It's about 88%, which is awesome. So overall, I really did enjoy this episode, and we got to see um, that a person who rescued Galadriel from the last end of episode two was, in fact, Elendil, the, uh, yeah. the, the once once and future king, as it were, right. played by Lloyd Owen. So yeah. if you guys don't know who this guy is, he's, he's Just this watch guy the over first here. watch five minutes of the original Fellowship of the Ring. You'll find out who it is. You will. You'll find out who it is. He's uh, he dies rather quickly, but you, yeah. you'll see him in that first first movie. Um, and right now, he's not the king. He's a captain at this point. Uh, he's so, soon to be future king of Numenor at some point, and father of Isildur, <laughs> which is the guy played by Maxim Baldry in this series. Now, wait a second, Chris. This guy yes. is Isildur. I. He doesn't look seven feet tall to me, and I, I don't even think he's supposed to be born yet. What in the heck is going on here, right? <laughs> seven feet tall? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a little uh, inside joke for the fans of the novels. Um, yeah. Sildor is, uh, yeah. Um, uh, abnormal I don't remember that in the novels. For, <laughs> for human beings in the uh, Middle Earth realm. But, uh, yeah, so... If you are a fan of the the novels, you will have some discrepancies that you notice between the characterization of Ellen Dill and Sildor here, the father and son. Mm -hmm. um, but did it distract <laughs> Chris? Was it uh, something that took away from the actor's performances? How did you feel? I don't about? think so. But the uh, the character was definitely distracted in this. But luckily, he saved that guy on the on the ship. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And he, he was being and like, you could hear it called out in the, the distance, Isildur. So something's <laughs> calling out to this guy. Yeah. But yeah, if, for, for those casual viewing audience, if you don't know who Isildur is, he does play a pretty critical role mm -hmm. in uh, the future Lord of the Rings. I don't know if you know about this. <laughs> Got a little bit of a ring on there. But <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely called it. Like I was talking about this last time we were on the show. Uh, we get to finally see the island of Numenor as Galadriel, yeah. who's played Asking by Morphe Clark. <laughs> What's that? Asking you shall receive. I mean, you you did. You right. called it last week. I so. was like, Numenor. Yeah, I think we're going to get to see Numenor, and, and yeah. absolutely we are. So Galadriel and Hallbrand, who's played by Charlie Vickers, 
um, they're sort of taken captive on this, and it's like, yay, we're saved! Oh, wait a second. <laughs> right. Uh, not everybody's friendly on this island. What's the deal? So we, we don't get a whole lot of insight with why they are not friendly with the elves as much in this yeah. episode, but I'm sure we're going to find out eventually. And I really, I, I really loved that uh, we got to see a lot of the lore in this episode, and oh, Elendil wow. um, takes Galadriel to the western side of Numenor, and they got to mention Elros, which is really cool. So I prepared a little bit of information for you guys out there, for you casual viewers and everything, so you can get up to speed with what you're watching. So let's talk a little bit about Elros. Uh, Elros is, in fact, the twin brother of somebody we've already met in this series, somebody we know from Lord of the Rings, Elrond. And you can see him in the mural and everything. They're twin brothers. Yeah. And, and both of those brothers are actually half-elves. <laughs> They're actually descended from the line of Baron and Luthien, the the female elf and the male human as well, that love story. Once again, Tolkien loves to repurpose stories over and over and over again. We'll talk about that a little bit, little bit later. Um, but after the War of the Wraith, which is the war against Morgoth, uh, the Valor, the Valor are, are kind of like their gods, like the, the supreme beings and everything. They gave these twins a choice on uh, over the race and fate. Um, that they would will be willing to have. So Elros chose to live as a mortal man, and he became the first king of Numenor, and Elrond chose to live as an elf. So Elrond's still alive today. Elros lived, like, up to, I think, like, 400 years as well. And as explained in this episode, during the Second Age, the Valor rewarded the humans here who fought with the elves. There were there were humans that fought with Morgoth, and there were humans who fought with, with the elves, um, and those humans that fought with the elves, they're called the Edain, and they were gifted an island that's the, the most west island that's close, close to Valinor, uh, and that became Numenor, the island that we see in this episode. So they gave, they gave that to the, these folks, which eventually became been known as the Edain, or Dunedain, as we know lo- later on, and they also blessed them with longer life, too. So these guys live like 300, 400 years. They live a lot longer than your your typical average human, the ones that we see in Middle Earth and the Southlands at this point. So when we get to see um, – I liked it, too, when Galadriel's doing the research and everything with all the scrolls with Elendil. Uh, we finally get to see that um, the symbol that Galadriel has been you know, finding all over the place in her quest to hunt down Sauron – it's not even really a symbol, but a location we find out. And once yeah. again, we got confirmation, right, buddy? Like, it, yep, it's uh, it's the location of Mordor, the place where they they're they're, they're gonna set up the shop for the orcs. Right now, but yeah, yeah. So the Southlands, it's been confirmed and everything now that it's eventually gonna become Mordor. So it's explained. And what what yeah. I think is uh, super cool about this is that if you in fact go back and watch the original Peter Jackson films. And uh, if you look at the maps that are featured in Tolkien's books, yep. this exact image is there in all of it's, the material. Yeah, and so, I will post a picture right here of, of the, uh, the map of Middle-earth in the Third Age so that you can see where Mordor is. And I'll put a picture down here, uh, right here, so you can see um, what the, the map and everything that uh, Galadriel used and everything with the symbol as well so should be up on the screen right now in uh in post-production now so we're <laughs> trying something new today uh and it's explained too at this point that uh this is a backup plan uh if morgoth loses to establish a land for the orcs and sauron uh is definitely working towards this goal and and this end yeah so once again uh we see the story uh, of the reluctant king hiding uh, with Hallbrand, we find out that he's meant to be king in the Southlands, I guess. So um, I don't know about you, Matt, but I, I really I, – I'm not sure if I really like this this storyline. No, because tread, it's, but like uh, you said, it's typical of Tolkien. Right. Um, I don't yeah. remember that. I mean there's a, there's a lot of theory around this guy, yeah. who he could be for real. And, you know, getting bits and pieces, obviously, yeah. throughout these episodes. But I, I don't – I don't recall a, a character like this or you know, mm-hmm. except for our Aragorn, right? Yeah. You know, the, the return of the king, all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it feels like a retread for sure. It, it definitely feels like a retread. I don't know how I feel about that. But again, like we said, you know, Tolkien 
always writes parallels in his story. It's kind of a repeating theme. I mean, even George Lucas does it in Star Wars, too. It's yeah. it's like poetry. It rhymes, that kind of thing. <laughs> so we get that a lot. Um, and, yeah, there is some rumors that Hullbrand might be one of those nine of the Nazgul and everything. He might be the Witch King of Angbar um, at, yeah. at some point. So that's the theory that's out there for you guys. I, Let us know what you think in the comments about I've that. I've also heard the theory that he is, in fact, Sauron with his sort of uh, fighting capabilities there. And maybe he hmm. doesn't realize it yet. Maybe there's some kind of reincarnation bit going on. Uh, maybe. So... Yeah, and I have like a whole like so. Stay tuned, guys. I do have a whole whole subject here um, about who Sauron could possibly be if we've yeah. seen him yet in the show. If we're going to see him soon, um, so that's coming up here in in a couple of minutes. And fun fact, right now, um, Robert Arameo, the guy who plays Elrond, he's no stranger to fantasy. Since we were talking about Elrond and Elros, uh, I wanted to bring this up. He's no stranger to fantasy. And uh, do you know what I'm talking about, Matt? Do you know what else he's been in? No idea. Oh, this is great. This is perfect, man. Um, and I found this out, and I was like, that is awesome. So actually, he has played a part in Game of Thrones. During a flashback, Robert Arameo actually played the young Eddard Stark. He really? was the guy. <laughs> yeah. And funny if you wow. think about it, too, because the older version of Ned Stark was played by who? John Bean. That's right. <laughs> the guy Bean. who played Boromir right. in the original Lord of the Rings, <laughs> Fellowship of the Ring. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so it comes around full circle or, or full ring, ring of power. Oh, that woo. Is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so I thought that was really cool information. I thought the guy did look familiar when I saw him in the first couple of episodes. Yeah. And after I saw that article, I was like, oh, my God, that's that's absolutely right. He was. So he's, yeah. he's been in fantasy before. Two of our, uh, our, our favorites on here, mm -hmm. Game of Thrones as well as Lord of the Rings. So that's pretty cool. And it's cool that Sean Bean got to play similar characters. Awesome stuff. So yeah. – we see that this na this episode is named after a character that we only get to really see at the end, out of focus, too. Out of focus, yeah. So this Adar character. And um, Arendir, the, the guy played by Ishmael Cruz Cordova, the, the most lovely elf you'll, you'll ever see, um, He we find out that that character was captured during this, and he's working digging you know trenches and everything so that these orcs can go around and, and avoid the sunlight and whatnot. He has to cut down a tree, which is really sad because elves, um, they they uh, they love trees and everything, love and they're living trees. creatures. And yeah, it's, it was that was really tragic to see that part. Um, and we find that like his commander's there too, who's he's also been captured, and the or and they that's where he finds out that the orcs leader is called Adar, and they yeah. both know Arendur's like that's an elvish name. What's going on with that? So I I, I kind of went and sleuthed around the internet and everything, and I was like, okay. Let's see if we can find anything up out about this Adar character. And apparently, Adar is not a character that's created by Tolkien. He's a new invention of this show, right. so we really don't have a lot of information. And I do believe that this guy is a fallen elf. You can kind of see the fuzzy picture, and if you look online, I think there's more clear pictures out there of this character. Um, but I don't believe that this is this is going to be our Sauron character. It's too. It would be too on the nose. And, uh, and I just don't see him being Sauron. And so if you go into the books of Lord of the Rings as well, uh, Sauron was known as a deceiver and was said to be de said to deceive the elves, the men, the dwarves. And so this is somebody that, you know, was brought in as a friend and whatnot. And uh, I don't like this guy is a pure villain at this point. There's no way this guy is going to fool the elves, right. the dwarves and the men at this point. And so I'm really I'm not convinced now too that uh, my buddy over here, Mister the the stranger, as you see in, in this video, um, already the cosplay, yes. yeah, already. So I, I tried to dress up as as kind of kind of your Hobbit, and I've got my little ring in here. Yeah, so. band in. Do -do 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 -do. So um, I'm I'm not convinced anymore that the stranger, the guy that's played by Daniel Wayman, the guy yeah. that fell from the earth, the. <laughs> Fell from the stars. It, I don't believe that he's Sauron either. And though you know, it's it's a pretty popular theory that's going around right now. And but I do think that the simplest explanation in this case is probably the right one. Yeah. It is probably Gandalf. I, I mean, and they say this in Lord of the Rings too, where you know it's like I think an agent of Sauron 
would would look fairer but uh, feel fouler and this guy he can't look much fouler so right and <laughs> I, know? I i i'm still in the track of this this guy is gandalf but um there's a part of me that noticed in episode three here how they cut from the mention of this you know evil that occurred in the world mm -hmm. to the harfoots like slowly doing kind of their uh dance uh, about ready to migrate and all that stuff so it's mm -hmm. taking us back to his storyline and i mm -hmm. thought that could be a subtle foreshadowing type of Maybe. nod and that uh, yeah evil is already got a, a stronghold and people that are helping this evil don't even know it yet so I, yeah. don't, I don't know i, I mean, don't know was, I, mean, I could be wrong they could be pulling the rug right underneath our, us right here with this stuff um and what about this like this this theory i don't know if this is true or not but what if what if we eventually see the, this harfoot uh community become like goblins or something and this is just right? like <laughs> this is there's, just like showing precursors the beginning of those yeah. Yeah. Well, so, and, and who knows? that's something that I think is going to be um, a difficult thing for this show to tackle is that all of this is eventually leading down some very dark paths. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the stuff that's coming um, is pretty grim. It so is pretty grim. For a show that is light, I mean, both literally uh, and with its plot it's it's going to be interesting to see how they they handle sort of this dive down to the worst parts of uh the middle earth timeline right yeah and so i, I really like i'm relying heavily on the books and you guys can leave comments and everything about like if, if you know anything extra that i haven't brought up here or discussions about theories about what's going on but if yeah. they stick to the books about sauron um he'll he'll be someone who works with Celebrimbor, which is the architect who Elrond was tasked to work with to create this great forge. So we should be seeing Sauron's character at some point hmm. entering into the picture a as as a certain character. So Celebrimbor, he was actually responsible for for the creation of the three rings of power, Ninya, Vilya, and Narya. And the books go in to say that Sauron was called at this point was called Anator, which um is is almost kind of similar to this this ador uh, but i think that that's just a, a red herring for this episode and yeah. anator means lord of gifts which is kind of similar like i said to ador but maybe not i don't know but anator in the books uh claimed that he was an emissary of the v valor and Celebrimbor really didn't trust this character at all but the other smiths were definitely deceived by him and Sauron, as Anator, instructed the smiths on how to make these rings. And so Celebrimbor forged those three elven rings himself. But the craft of actually forging those rings, that was taught by Sauron. And it incorporated that binding magic, which is yeah. how he was able to rule them all. And he produced the one ring in, in secret. So this character of Anator, Anator might be showing up at some point so who's to say who anator is or will who he will end up being in this story it could be the stranger it could be adar but i bet that it's it's not adar and i'm kind of on the fence i i don't think it's the stranger either and you know for me it's like um moving forward in in this episode it was also like once again it was so so moving to see the harfoots which ritual that they uh they had for their migration that was so awesome to see that kind of a culture thing mm -hmm. in this show and the remembrance of those that were left behind which gives weight to the real concern right now that you know about nori's dad largo brandfoot played by dylan smith mm -hmm. and his ability to actually migrate with a broken ankle so it puts a lot of weight onto that because they're they're sitting there remembering these people and there's this real fear that her dad's not going to be able to make this trek and he's going to be left behind too and this is also where we learn that Nori's friend, Poppy Proudfellow, played by Megan Richards, which is doing a fantastic job too. She's doing great in this. Uh, we we get the we see that she lost her parents during a previous migration. She was crying during this remembrance, and it was just heartfelt. It's so moving. And with the stranger being caught during this event, and eventually wanting to help Nori and her family with the cart and everything, so that they can come along with. 
it's a lovely piece of the episode. And once again, you know, I'm it's centering as the heart of the story for me. So if anything bad happens to these people, Matt, I am going to be livid when it comes to this. So, yeah. but maybe, maybe that's the, maybe that's where we're it's headed with this. <laughs> oh God, I hope not. But I just I, I find pure joy with the Harfoots, and I, I love that storyline. And overall, I did I did very much enjoy this episode and the expansion of the world that we're seeing here. I especially loved getting to finally see Numenor, this this uh, this island that we have read about in the books in the Similarian in Lord of the Rings. It's like oh, finally we get to see this and seeing like the architecture and the parallels that we see with Gondor, which is a city that's that's established way after this and everything that draws inspiration from Numenor because it's from the ancestors of the Numenorians. So it's really cool to see see those parallels too in this episode and the beauty of it. I guess a uh, big influence for Numenor was uh, Venice. They, they, they drew a lot of inspiration right. from Venice with, you know, a city that's near the water and whatnot. So beautifully done. Oh, man, it's just once again, they're putting all the money out front, and it's looking gorgeous as all, oh, yeah. always. So for my score today, what I'm going to give this is a solid 8 out of 10. I th- I did that last week for the last two episodes too, <laughs> but, you know, it, it was pretty good. This was another amazingly beautiful episode, and – I just wish we could have caught up with the dwarves again, uh, mm-hmm. since I, I really, really liked that element in the last episode, in episode two. But I'm sure that we'll catch up with them next week, too. So, 8 out of 10 for me. What did you think of this episode, Mr. Matt Paham? Man, I, I'm telling you, this is just rapidly becoming my new favorite thing to do too. On, a, on a Friday, because, wow, um, it just everything like you said is so beautiful and so well done I, i'm very glad that you brought up as many of the actors in your review because as i was trying to think how am i going to review this episode there's so much to say there's a ton. Did so right i'd hate to leave anything out and the actors are definitely a big part of that so i'm glad you said something about it because that allows me to say that the other standout i believe is Witta fx they are oh, yeah. knocking it out of the park and of course many of you know uh they worked on the original trilogy lord of the rings and hobbit mm-hmm. um and so they're no stranger to bringing middle earth to life but it is just so amazing the complexity i'm telling you 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 gotta watch this show on the biggest screen that you had that's my only qualm is that Mm -hmm. we can't go to the theaters and see this stuff wouldn't that be awesome to to have this in the theaters too oh oh, cool i hope that they do something like that you know i hope that good old alamo or somebody out there takes it upon themselves to release this stuff in the theaters because man i when they pull into numenor i mean aside from the statues and all that stuff Mm-hmm. scan your eyes around the screen there's like tiny villages i mean it, it looks like so Morocco. much information it, it just yeah. oh venice uh, yeah it, it's so many cool cultural things that they put into these shots that are gone in the blink of an eye but yeah. are part of you being encapsulated and engrossed in this world and it makes it feel so real and authentic um, that I, I had to uh, make a note uh, to to sing their praises in today's review because Witta is just doing a fantastic job. Hats Making off to it, you, yeah, Witta. Absolutely. To uh, Witta and every hardworking visual effects person there, mm-hmm. um, I, you, you just cannot do any wrong. I mean, even down to the creature features. You know, we got our first introduction of what a warg looks like in uh, – Yes. Oh, and brutal too. Like, too. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was. Um, you know, I mean, but if you had something as crazy as that kind of being out there, it's not going to be uh, fun to watch it attack anything. No. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they really didn't uh, spare. They didn't much. shy away from that gore either. That was <laughs> on no. Front Street. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, it's at a certain point you got to make your cgi characters scary and they've done well so far with the snow yeah. cave troll thing and now the warg uh and the sea monster and all that stuff that just look oh. so so well done and i mean any any point you know usually when you're watching shows of this caliber 
that have a ton of visual effects, there are moments where you're just kind of like, well, that looked just a slight bit too smooth, but it's still so detailed and so cool looking. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm just gone. Every time I watch this show, there's not a single frame that I'm drawn out because of some weirdness to the special effects. It's just so on point and beautifully done. Like I was mentioning earlier, they have everything illuminated. Even in the dark yeah. scenes, there's a light piercing through something because it, it's such the, the feeling of the Tolkien stories. You know, the, the hope is always in there. As grim as it gets, the dwarves will have their songs to rely on or right. the hobbits will have their community. I mean, everybody's got just like these little ways of staying hopeful even in the worst of times. And so visually, you capture that feeling by having light sources everywhere and by being able to see the beautiful production value that this show has. So uh, that was definitely a standout for me about this episode. Also, the balancing of the lore, all that stuff that you mentioned um, that I won't belabor, but there was so much packed in here. And I think yeah. done in a way that also served the progression of the story. You know, sometimes you just get all of this exposition because they have to, you know, get you up to speed if you're not a reader of the novels or something like that. They've got to explain this kind of stuff to you. But I think they did it in such a way that was still true to the characters and their moments. You know, they would need to explain this kind of thing to each other. It just didn't right. come out of the blue. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I felt like all of that was beautifully written. Um, and the whole episode was very well acted and just encapsulated in mystery. My only qualm with the episode is that I, I wish that Amazon had released these things all together so that you could just binge <laughs> through oh, yeah. you know, I like I like taking it week to week, though. It gives I, us I an opportunity it, to it, talk it, about it. It's so. purely selfishness. It's pure, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I do like, though, the slow burn and being able to enjoy this over – you know, a couple of months uh, mm -hmm. versus binging it all at once. But I, I'm in the moment, I'm just selfishly like, man, I wish I could watch the next one. <laughs> I just love it. I love to be able to talk about the theories and everything like, oh, how yeah. are they going to introduce Sauron here? Is it who is this right. Adar character? And I, mm -hmm. I just love it. And just just dive deep into these things is what we're doing here on Fatherly Phantom. So if you enjoy yeah. this kind of stuff, please hit the subscribe button, like our page, like like this video and get us out there so that we can continue to talk about these fun stuff with you and our community too. So absolutely, absolutely. Cause there's just so much theory to draw on right? from episodes like this. It's mm -hmm. very much a middle of a story episode. And so beginning and ending are just really to continue to progress us on to whatever comes next. And uh, a couple other theories that I have read out there that are pretty interesting, man. Let's One, hear it. Yeah, is that the uh, the stranger here may not be that Sauron. Guy? <laughs> that guy may not be Gandalf, may not even be Saruman, which is another mm -hmm. theory that I kind of have on the back burner. Um, some people have speculated that he is actually Tom Bombadil, Ooh. <laughs> which uh, could huh. make sense. I mean, there, there's, you know... It, everybody's kind of got their qualms with the timeline and stuff but yeah for me the, they're taking the parts of the book that uh, are the most essential to a story that they can tell in a medium like this yeah so that's going to involve some compression that's going to involve some overlap of storylines and legally, um, they're bound to to only use materials from Lord of the Rings, the appendices. They cannot use anything from the Similarian. Um, so they are actually constrained with what they can actually use in the series. And this, this might bring up some chagrin for some fans, but you got to realize that like they, they are constrained for what they can produce here. It's unfortunate yeah. that they can't draw on all the Tolkien material, but they're doing the best that they can, too. And... That yeah. would be an interesting thing if it does turn out to be Tom Bombadil. I would love to see Tom Bombadil come up in one of these things. He like he was one of my favorite characters in the book, um, but it didn't make sense for the film too because like he just grabs the yeah. ring and is just like, oh look at this ring, oh, it's nothing. Doesn't nothing care about big. it. Not yeah. yeah. 
the one well, being in the whole <laughs> Middle Earth that uh, wasn't affected by the ring. I yeah. guess so. <laughs> but well, uh, he was a fun character. Typical with Tolkien, you know, he was obsessed with his work, and yeah. it, he he passed that along to the fans with all this level of detail. But right. at a certain point, when you're writing for a TV show or a movie, you have to do some compression. We saw that in the original trilogies as well. You know, Tom sure. was part of a deleted scene, I believe, and wasn't in either the theatrical or extended releases of the film. Yep. But also the fact that the passage of time was compressed. You know, by yep. the introduction of the ring to Frodo and Bilbo um, in the Shire at the beginning of the story, to them actually going um, to meet with Elrond and, and all that, there's a 17-year time span there. Mm -hmm. So, of course, there nobody's going to begin a movie <laughs> yeah. with the introduction of, you know, the biggest MacGuffin in, in you know, fictional history and then say, all right, let's come up with a way to montage 17 years passing or something. And it's just, it's not going to make much sense. So no. they got to so do So I think that they're stuff. doing the best that they can with yeah. this material on, yeah, I think you know, so. in a live action show. So, yeah. And it, hats it off. Just, yeah, hats off. It look it looks great. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's beautifully acted. It's beautifully written. And uh, for me, my rating... Um, for this episode has got to be a nine out of ten. I mean, I nine was out of 10? I was so close to ten out of ten. The only reason it's not is because it's just it also feels like one of those middle of the story type episodes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's never going to be a hundred percent satisfying, but it has to be yeah. that way. It has to keep you engrossed. So um, yeah, nine out of ten for me. Perfect. So we got a nine out of ten for Matt. And an 8 out of 10 for me. I hope I can join you with a 9 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10 next week on, on next week's episode, which does premiere at 9 p.m. on Thursday, Pacific Standard Time, or uh, midnight for you Eastern Standard Time folks. Uh, and you can catch it all Friday, and we will try to record next week for that. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, anything else before we depart these lands of, of Middle Earth there? No, I'm yeah, uh, no. about done and uh, getting ready to go <laughs> shave. And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got to be clean shaven tomorrow for our episode of Thor: Love and Thunder. So, yeah, yeah. I get, yeah, I can wear this whole thing if I can dye it blonde. <laughs> you, yeah, you got to dye it blonde. You'll be ready to go for that episode. Yeah. That, that's true. You could do that too. That's so. right. Get my '80s soundtrack on. <laughs> Perfect. Let's do that. In the meantime, guys, subscribe to our channel like this video and get the news out there comment below about what you thought about this episode of rings of power let us know and we will read it on the air for the next episode so all right from our families to yours adios have a good one